Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8. We'll be reading this morning verses 26 through 39. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. As we visit a while on a topic I've titled, Chasing Chariots. When we read here in Acts chapter 8, we have a chariot, we have someone in the chariot, and we have someone chasing the chariot. I want you to know this morning, absolutely, that there are three kinds of people that are here this morning. There are some of you this morning that are chasing the chariot. There are others that are just riding the chariot. And then there are some that are just observing the chariot. Please, if you have in your Bibles, Acts chapter 8, stand with me for the, the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, re reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and he began at the same scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hindereth me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believeth with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word. I ask, Lord, that you would meet with us this morning, that you would feed us with the bread of life. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Martin Luther made a statement. A religion that gives nothing, a religion that costs nothing, a religion that suffers nothing, is worth absolutely nothing. Never before has there been a time in history that this has been more true. I read a story of a man and his son that were very close. They shared the love of art, one with the other. The father happened to be of well means, so he had acquired some priceless works of art. The father had Picassos. He had Rembrandts. He had copies of some of the most wonderful works of Van Gogh that were ever known to man. And the father and the son loved the art. And they would sit together and they would take in the beauty of the artwork that had been rent in such majesty together. And it was a source 
of love and bonding between the father and the son. During the Vietnam War, the son was drafted into the service, went off to serve in Vietnam, left his father. One day the knock comes at the father's door, the knock that every father dreads. I can tell you that I've had a son that served twice in Afghanistan and once in Iraq, and Marianne and I worried continually about our son. We prayed for him because we wanted him to come home, but the horrors and the terror of war are not all come home. And the knock came at the door and a uniformed man told the father that his son had been killed in Vietnam. The father was crushed. His spirit was downcast. About a month later, a knock came at his door again. And a young man stood there with a package wrapped in a brown paper bag. And he said, sir, you don't know me, but I served with your son in Vietnam. He said, as a matter of fact, your son was carrying me to safety when he was killed. And he said, your son loved you with all of his heart and he used to share with me how he sat with you and looked at the beautiful works of art together, the Picassos and the Rembrandts, and that the two of you shared such a marvelous love for art. And he said, I just wanted to do this for you. And he took the paper bag off and it was a painting of his son. And the young man said, I'm not much of an artist and I know it's not very good. But he said, I, I painted this picture of him, and I want you to have it. The father was so touched. And after visiting with the young man, and when the young man left, the father took the painting of his son, and he hung it up over the fireplace mantle so that he could be sure that he looked at it every day. And it seemed like every day as he looked at the portrait of his son, he could see a gleam in his eye. He could actually feel the personality of his son there with him. It was meaningful. Sometime later, the father passed away. And they had an auction for the priceless art that had been collected by the father. The man was known far and wide for his art collection, and crowds showed up in mass to bid on the painting that were in the man's house. And the auctioneer got up to start the auction and pulled a drapery off the table and there was a picture of the son. And he said, we're going to start this auction today with the son. Who will take the son? Who will give me a bid for the son? Silence went through the room. Finally, one man sitting at the back said, Nobody wants that. Let's get on with the auction. Give us the Picassos. Where's the Picassos? The auctioneer just ignored him. And again he said, The sun. Who will bid on the sun? Who will take the sun today? And another person in another part of the room chided in and said, we don't care about some nobody painting of the sun. Get on with the, where's the Rembrandts? We want the Rembrandt. Again, the auctioneer said, who will take the sun today? Who will give me a bid? Can I have a hundred dollar bid for the sun? Can I have a, a fifty dollar bid? Will somebody bid on the sun? Would anyone today take the sun? And a weak voice at the back said, I'll give $10 for the son. It was the gardener that worked at the man's house. He was of little means, but he was willing to give $10 for the son. The auctioneer said, I've got a bid of $10 for the son. $10 going once, $10 going twice. Sold to the man in the back, the son, for $10. Another man at the other side of the building chided in, Thank goodness that's over with. Now can we get to the real auction? The auctioneer took his gavel, pounded it on the table, and said, The auction is finished. It's done. 
the people were almost in a mutiny and they, they spoke up. They said, what do you mean it's over? You, you haven't auctioned the, the Rembrandts and the Van Goghs, the fine works of art. We want those. And the auctioneer said, excuse me. But according to the will, there was a secret stipulation. You see, I'm only to auction the son. And the one who takes the son takes everything. When you get the son, you get it all. Amen? This morning, as we talk about chasing chariots, I want to remind you that when we take the son, we take everything. On an old rugged cross, in Calvary, well over 2,000 years ago, the Father gave the Son. And He who takes the Son takes everything. Christians, we have a responsibility to share the Son with a lost and a dying and a hurting world. We're to share His sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. We're to share the salvation that He gives us. His great love to liberate lives. His longing to lift our load. His Lordship that leads us daily. We have a, a new world order. And I want to say to you this morning that the new world order has a new world odor. Society is sick. We've forgotten about the Son. Christians, we've forgotten about the Son. And we need to remember that He who has the Son has everything. The United Nations, among all of their great and mighty marvelous works that they <laughs> supposedly perform, with money that's given to them by our government, has a very special report that they work on every year. It's called the World Happiness Report. Aren't you glad to hear that the United Nations is spending its time giving us a World Happiness Report? But this morning I wanted to share a few of the things that they've come up with in the World Happiness Report. They say Americans are among the most unhappy people in the world today and the unhappiness is increasing. The happiness index in the world has dropped 46% since 1980. They're working harder and living less. Money doesn't fix it. Incomes have tripled since 1960, yet satisfaction and life fulfillment has fallen. The world GDP, the gross domestic product, is higher than ever, yet the suicide rate has surpassed the GDP. The United Nations identified five factors that they believe are making people so unhappy. Listen, number one, they said life expectancy. People are afraid of eternal death. Social support. People have lost faith in friends and family and the goodness of people in their government. Freedom. Lives are dominated and controlled. There's no more liberty. Generosity. We live in a selfish society where nobody wants to give any longer. And corruption. Dishonesty abounds. There's a discourse of division in our land. Yet, loved ones, in the midst of all of this unhappiness, all of this unfulfillment, all of the unworthiness, Christians have an answer to the unhappiness in life. Yet, it seems we're reluctant to share. We're reluctant to care. Why? Why is it as Christians that we're not more active? I want you to know that peace is only possible, loved ones, when we know the Prince of Peace. Happiness is only harmonious in Jesus Christ. If we go back to the story of the painting of the sun, 
We need to constantly remind ourselves that those who accept the Son get everything. Go back to those social factors that the United Nations gave us for a moment. I want us to look at those in the light of God's Word because we have an absolute promise and assurance in God's Word for every one of those problems that make people unhappy, unfulfilled, and that leave their lives wanting. People that are worried about life expectancy, they only need to look at John 10.28. When Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. The problem of social support is answered in John 15, 13. I, greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. People that are worried about freedom need to go to John 8, 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you are free indeed. Those who are concerned about generosity need to look at Revelation 22.17. Whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life. What? Freely. Freely. That's generosity. Those who are concerned about corruption need to go to Matthew 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Jesus is the only answer to our anomaly. He is peace. He is prosperity. He gives us purpose. He constrains us. He restrains us. He continues to maintain us. Jesus is all in all. Philippians 4, 7 says, The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. We have the answer. We know the answer to worthlessness, wantonness, wastefulness, worldliness, Jesus. It's the Son, the Savior of the world. Yet, I have a puzzling question. It, it puzzles my mind that we have the answer, why don't Christians share Him? Why don't we really care about them? Over 100 million attend church every week and listen, more than 49% of them are unbelievers. I read a statistic that shocks me. The average Christian in America will die and will have never one time shared Christ with someone else. What a staggering statistic. It should break our heart. It should shatter our world. It's a travesty. It's troubling. And in our text today, we read about an unhappy person who was on an unlikely journey. And he ran into an uninhibited Christian. The eunuch in a chariot met the deacon named Philip. His life was changed forever. Because Philip was not uninhibited, he was eager to share Jesus Christ. He was eager and excited about Jesus and what he could do in the life of this eunuch. There's three things this morning that I think we can glean from this passage of Scripture. Chasing chariots. Loved ones, you and I need to be involved Chasing chariots. As I mentioned at the outset, we'll either be chasing chariots or we'll just be observing chariots. But there may be some of us this morning that are here that are actually riding in the chariot. The first thing I want you to notice this morning in this passage of Scripture is that we had a present subject. In verse 27 and 28, it says, he had come to Jerusalem for to worship and was returning and sitting in his chariot reading Esaias the prophet. I want us to pay attention to this eunuch that's in the chariot. 
According to what we read in God's Word, he was a VIP. Anyone know what a VIP is? This eunuch was a very important person. Because we read in Scripture that he had the authority of the Queen Mother Candace of Nubia. He was her business manager. He was a trusted confidant, a tried counselor, a true companion to the Queen. This eunuch was not an ordinary person. He was a VIP. How many of you know this morning, VIPs need Jesus? I don't care how important you are, how lofty you are, where you come from, what you do, how much money you have, He who has the Son has everything. And unless you have the Son, you have nothing. The eunuch is a VIP. But I also notice that he's a VRP. He was not only a very important person, he was a very religious person. We know that by reading verse 28 when it says he had come to Jerusalem to worship and he was reading Esaias the prophet. This eunuch had traveled 200 miles in a chariot on a quest to find God. (laughs) How ironic is it that we can't get people to drive two blocks in search of God. But he had ridden more than 200 miles Along his 200-mile trek, he had explored the different religions that exist in Africa. He had viewed all the multiple gods of Egypt. He had been exposed to the Canaanite gods in Philistia. In Jerusalem, he had found the empty shell of Judaism. And he's searching for happiness, meaning in a meaningless world. He's hungry for the bread of life. He's thirsting for the water of life. But when we pick up this passage of Scripture, the eunuch is returning in the same condition that he came. He's disappointed. He's disillusioned. He's disheartened. Loved ones, there are very religious people, VRPs, all around us in our everyday life. And listen to me. They need less religion and a whole lot more relationship. Amen? They don't need rules and regulations. They need the Prince of Peace. They need Jesus Christ. He was a very religious person, but he was not only a VIP and not only a VRP, but we read in Scripture that he was a VPP. He was a very prepared person. Verse 29 says, The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join yourself to this chariot. This tells me that the Holy Spirit of God was at work in the life of this unit. The Holy Spirit had been preparing his heart, preparing his mind, had brought conviction into his life that there was something lacking. There was a hole in the middle of his heart that could not be filled. He was a very prepared person. Loved ones, when the Holy Spirit is involved, He prepares the way for Christians to share the Son. This eunuch was sincerely seeking. He was searching for God. John chapter 6, verse 44 says, No man can come unless what? The Father draws him. The eunuch is being drawn to the source of life. He's being drawn away from the source of lack. And he's being drawn into the source of love. The hole in his heart had left him unfulfilled and discontent. He's influential. He's important. But he's incomplete. How many people are around us in our lives every single day that may be VIPs, They may be VRPs. They may be VPPs, but they're unhappy. They're incomplete. This eunuch could buy anything he wants. 
He can command anything to be done and it will happen. He can direct His very will and it will take place, but He's empty and He's exhausted. The very prepared person has a very perplexing problem. There are VPPs all around us. They're lost in sociology, technology, humanology. They're searching for companionship and relationship to fix them. They're hungry for a relationship that's real, that's reviving, that's reinvigorating. Perhaps this morning that very prepared person might be you. Maybe the Holy Spirit is working in your heart and in your life, and maybe you've been blessed, and maybe you have riches, and maybe you have wealth, and maybe you have possessions, and maybe you share a good job, and maybe you have a good marriage, but inside of you there's something missing. There's an emptiness that you can't find a way to fill. And you're prepared today for a change. Could I say that we need someone to chase your chariot? Philip was available for the task. We have people in our society that are experimenting with cults. And listen, there are people who are exhausted in our churches because we're full of rules and regulations and doctrines and dogma and we play little guilt games on people. They're not looking for those things. They're already unhappy. They're already unfulfilled. They need a relationship because He who has the Son has everything. Let me ask you this morning, who's chasing their chariot? Are you? We all need to be chasing chariots. They need someone to care. They need somebody to share. We have chariots in our churches, in our schools, at our jobs, at our homes, and they don't need empty rituals. They don't need endless repetitions or elaborate rules. They need a righteous Redeemer. They need love that's enduring. Life that's endearing. Liberty that's enhancing. They need forgiveness, fulfillment, and freedom. And it's only found in Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, are you chasing their chariot? Or are you choosing convenience and compromise? Look what the eunuch in verse 31 told Philip. How can I, except some man should guide me? Loved ones, there are people all around us begging, wanting, thirsting, hurting, asking for somebody to guide them. For somebody to share Jesus Christ. For someone to care enough to chase the chariot. And loved ones, we're either guiding or we're merely sitting by and gawking while the lost world is gasping and grieving and asking for help. People are searching. They have empty lives and endless longing. They're prepared for change. So we see a present person. But number two this morning, I see a prompt servant. In verse 29, the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. Now Philip was a deacon. He was conducting a revival in Jerusalem. He had had great success. He had had over a thousand saved. God was working miracles. Philip was a busy man. Maybe Philip didn't have time for this task. But notice, he is a prompt servant. He was prompted by the Spirit. He was prompt to the call. He ignored race. He ignored riches. He ignored religion. He ignored the schedule of his routine. And he responded. He was accessible to God. Loved ones, if we're going to be used by God, we must be accessible to chase chariots. We need to be instant, in season and out. It's impossible to give what we do not possess. 
Philip was engaged with God. He was excelling in the Lord. He was enthused with His love. And in our fast-paced, hectic world, it's harder and harder to find people that are accessible to God. Oh, we got family and friend responsibilities. We have occupations. We have church duties. We have kid duties. We have recreation and relationships. All of these loved ones are fine in perspective, but they're flawed in priority. Because they take us away and they draw us away and they keep us from being accessible to God to chase chariots. Amen? It's a hectic life we live. We're so responsible that we're not accessible. Jesus should be always our first priority. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29 says, Everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit, what? Everlasting life. We get our priorities confused. Loved one, this morning, it is not family God and country. No. No. We need our priorities reorganized. It's God. First. Foremost. Fully. And forever. He is first. And unless He's first, our chariot will be dragged. Jesus gave His all for you and me. How dare we give less? How dare we put Him in second place? How dare we make Him follow our children's recreational activities? How dare we ask Him to acquiesce to recreational activities that we want in our life? How dare we ask Him to take second place behind our wants and our needs? Our churches are caught up in baptisms and buildings and budgets. And more and more, we're not accessible to the lost and the lonely and the logging. I'm so glad that God's Word shared about Philip. And that he was accessible to chase chariot. But not only was he accessible, he was available. God's Word says he was ready. In verse 30, and Philip ran, ran to him. He didn't drag to him. He didn't say, when I get around to it, Philip ran to him. He didn't consult his calendar, amen? <laughs> he didn't have excuses. There wasn't a delay for the activities that he needed to do. He didn't question the timing. He didn't question the task. He was available when the Holy Spirit moved upon Him. And unless we're accessible where the Holy Spirit can get a hold of our lives, then we cannot be available to our loved ones, to our friends, to our relatives, to our working associates who are in the chariot, who are suffering and looking for an answer and fulfillment in their life, and we can't be available for them. This eunuch was in his chariot. He had footmen that ran alongside, that surveyed the road and detected danger and protected the dignitary. Philip could have made all kinds of excuses. Hey, I have no authority to approach this chariot. I'm not dressed for a dignitary. I can't keep up with the footmen. On and on and on the excuses could have gone. How many excuses do you and I make every day? God lays upon our heart a burden for someone. We need to be chasing their chariot, but we have an excuse. We need to be available in Wednesday night prayer meeting. Listen, loved ones, this is a burden of my heart. At the basis of everything that God has called us to do as a church, at the base of everything that God has called you and I to be as Christians, is prayer. Communion with Him. We shouldn't be able to hold everybody in Wednesday night prayer meeting. If we're going to be available and if we're going to be accessible to chase chariots, we need to be involved in prayer. 
It needs to be a priority in our life. Yet so many times, we're busy. We have excuses. How available are we to chase cherries? He was ready, but he was also steady. Philip went where God wanted, when God wanted. In verse 28, it tells us that the chariot was moving because the Ethiopian eunuch was returning. The processional passed Philip by, and according to Scripture, about the time it passed him by, the Holy Spirit spoke to Philip and said, That's your man! That's him right there! I want you to witness to him he has a need. And Philip began to chase the chariot. How many times do you and I have opportunities every single day to share with someone who's in the chariot, who's unhappy, who's unfulfilled, who's lost, who may be heartbroken and ravished on the rocks of life. We have an opportunity to reach down and love them and share the love of Jesus Christ because He who has the Son has everything. We have an opportunity to chase chariots. Philip was responsive to the Holy Spirit. He ran and he chased down the chariots. Philip not only ran to the chariot, he rose to the occasion. Amen? How willing are we to chase chariots? We should be willing. As Christians, we ought to be in time, on time, all the time. I'm reminded of that song, People Need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. So we have a present subject. We have a prompt servant. But notice in this passage of Scripture also this morning, we had a pertinent Scripture. In verse 30 it says, And Philip heard him read the prophet Esaias, Isaiah. This scripture is an SOS to everyone who has a need. Isaiah 53, 3-7, listen to it. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one unto his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. That's a powerful scripture. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading the prophet Esaias. That's a pertinent scripture. It's a scripture of sacrifice. In verse 32, the place of the Scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he openeth not his mouth. Jesus is the lamb slain. The silent son who's the sacrifice for sin. It's a Scripture of sacrifice, but it's also a Scripture of solitude. In verse 33, it says, In His humiliation, His judgment was taken away. And who shall declare His generation? For His life is taken from the earth. The Lamb of God was humiliated. And He served in solitude as the Father turned His face away from Him. The flock ran from Him in disgrace. The Son of God was shunned in shame. Think about something. This eunuch, by mere stature of the fact that he was a eunuch, could relate to what he was reading about Jesus Christ. You see, the eunuch had been emasculated. And that was considered in that day a deformity. He would not be accepted to sacrifice in the temple because Judaism 
would not accept deformity. It must be a perfect specimen. So you see, the eunuch, as he read about the despised, shunned Jesus, was prepared. He could relate to Him in his own heart. He had been on his own, all alone, all of his life. Forced into a life of solitude. And as he read this Scripture, that's a pertinent Scripture for all of us. And as he read the Scripture, that's a Scripture of sacrifice and a Scripture of solitude, he understood that it was the Scripture of a Savior. In verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Loved ones, Jesus is the only answer for unworthy people. It's the only answer for the unholy and the unhappy. Only Jesus can satisfy our debt of sin. Only He can sanctify the dead sinner. Only He can salvage despair. In Christ alone I place my trust. I find my glory in the power of His cross. Acts chapter 4 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among heaven, whereby we must be saved. It's a Scripture of a Savior. It's a Scripture of a personal salvation. Look at the end of this story. The eunuch... Believe. Verse 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. His search for happiness was over. What was impossible with others was immediate with Jesus Christ. Why? How did this happen? Because Philip chased Charity. And not only did he believe, but immediately he received. Because we're told in verse 38, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Recall the eunuch's problem. Recall his imperfection. Recall how he had been ignored by society. How he had been ignored and 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 literally eviscerated by religious rules. Yet all of a sudden, he meets a Savior. A Savior that it receives him just as he is. A Savior who loves him just the way he comes. A Savior that can fill the emptiness, the void in his life, everything he's been looking for. He experiences the joy of exception. A jubilation of atonement. Loved ones, we have the greatest message in the world. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to save you. Amen? The greatest message the world has ever known, we should be chasing chariots. We should be looking for those needs in life and fulfilling them. We should be near to our loved ones, our friends, our relatives, our neighbors, and willing to chase down the chariots. Because not only did the eunuch believe, and not only did he receive, but he was relieved. Amen? In verse 39 it says, When they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. He was happy. All because somebody chased the cherry. How about you this morning? Are you available to chase chariots? Are you accessible to God? The chase chariots. We all have friends and family and a nation and a world that are longing for fulfillment and happiness. But they need, like this eunuch, someone to guide them. But loved ones, if you're here this morning, maybe you're in the chariot. Maybe you're searching for that longing and fulfillment in life. Maybe you can't find the happiness because you've never found the source of happiness. You haven't found the Savior. 
If you're in that chariot this morning, I want to reach out to you. I want to chase your chariot. Amen? I want to let you know Jesus loves you and Jesus wants to save you. And He died to heal and to redeem you. And there's a source of life and a source of strength that's available. No Jesus, no joy. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no happiness. No Jesus, no life. Are you chasing chariots this morning? Let's stand together. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Listen, Christian, I want to challenge you this morning. We need Christians to chase chariots. We need Phillips to be available and accessible. Looking for every opportunity to share with a lost and dying world Jesus Christ and His great love. If God's spoken to your heart this morning, make that a commitment in your life. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, you can't fill that hole that's within your heart. The wanting and the unhappiness and the uncertainty will continue. But you can change all of that today. You can accept Him. He loves you just like you are. He doesn't care where you came from. He doesn't care what you did. He doesn't care who says what about you. He loves you. He wants you. Come to Him today. Come to His love. If you're looking for a church home, we'll love you. We'd love to have you. The Holy Spirit moves on your life. Make that commitment. If you've never followed Him in baptism, follow what the Lord would have you do. Heavenly Father, we love You. Help us to chase chariots. Help us to be willing and accessible and available to You. Thank You for Jesus. Thank You for His great love. Thank You for Your faithfulness. Great, great is Your faithfulness. So Father, move on every heart as You will. In Jesus' name. Amen.